Good afternoon. Thanks so much for joining me here. I am really excited to give this presentation because this has been the culmination of several months' worth of work. And I think it's some of the work that we are most proud of at the lab. So I want to begin with a moment where I'd ask everyone to take a deep breath. What I'm going to be describing here is not simple, and I want to be as direct and clear about the work that we are doing, but I also want to give a respectful warning because what I will be showing you are images that anyone in the right mind should be disturbed by. Because we are in the middle of a terrible, terrible war that is just taking place hours of flight from here. I want to take you back to June 1st of 2022. The city of Kharkiv was settling into dusk, cradled by clouds and lulled by the distant sound of thunder. And as the light rain came into the city, suddenly things got quiet. Very, very quiet, ominously quiet. As a rain of artillery suddenly descended on the city, systematically attacking civilians and civilian infrastructure. You could actually see this play out online. People were begging people to listen very clearly because what they were hearing now was no longer thunder, they were hearing bombs. And they were asking people to move to take shelter. Mind you, their homes had already been destroyed, so the places where they could take shelter were public places like subways and schools. This is Kharkiv. It's Ukraine's second largest city. Think of it as the Cambridge, Massachusetts of the country. It's a, a city that is filled with students, over 200,000 students, 24 different schools and universities, hundreds of secondary schools. And that city has been systematically attacked since the very beginning of the war, and one of such schools that was attacked was this school, School 17. It had been attacked multiple times, in fact, since the beginning of the war. You could see the school is, it's not a, military base. It is an institution that is dedicated to serving children. And an attack on such an institution is in fact an attack on children and children's future. You can see that School 17 is in a densely populated residential area. It is surrounded by other schools and a children's hospital. These are what's known in international law as protected objects meaning that if they are attacked on the basis of them being civilian infrastructure, an attack on these sites is a war crime. The first evidence that we had of the attack on School 17 appeared online in the form of a telegram post. Just this, think of it as an ephemeral, vulnerable piece of content that went up, and that's evidence, the very first piece of evidence that we had of this attack. And what followed, as our friends at the Forensic uh, Digital Forensic Research Lab at the Atlantic Council showed us was that, in fact, there were coordinated attacks and coordinated evidence, and they, in fact, found over 144 different pieces of social media content that documented attacks over a two-week period in March. Working with them and our brave partners over at Hala Systems, who are actually based here in Lisbon, we went out to start to figure out how we could take these types of ephemeral content posts and get them to serve as an evidence base for documenting war crimes in places like Kharkiv. Our work at the Starling Lab, I would say, unfortunately prepared us for this task. For the last four years, we've been working with the Web3 community to figure out how we can understand the possibility of Web3 tools as they might be used to help advance human rights. We began this journey by protecting the Visual History Archive, which is the largest archive of its kind. It takes the testimony of the survivors of genocide from over 10 different conflicts. And we figured out a way to take this 
four petabytes worth of this information and put it onto the decentralized web as a more resilient and safe way of storing this information. We expanded our work to think about authenticated photography, and we partnered with Reuters to authenticate their coverage of the 2020 election using cryptographic chains of custody that actually began in the cameras themselves. And then finally, three years ago, we began working on documenting war crimes in Northwest Syria with our partners at Hala Systems. And I should mention that there, there is a common aggressor to the conflict in Ukraine. Russia has been involved in systemic war crimes in Syria, and it was those same war crimes that gave us a chance to think about how we could now defend Ukraine in their quest for justice. Our team worked furiously since the beginning of the conflict in uh, late February to actually develop a brand new system to do this form of documentation. I, we had dedicated members of our team that spent many countless nights not sleeping because they realized that they needed to bring new tools to this conflict. And we decided that what we really wanted to do was actually work in partnership with Ukrainians to figure out a way to document these war crimes. And we gave the name to this project, Project Dokaz, which is the Ukrainian word for proof or evidence. Project Dokaz is one that is part of a larger effort that we're engaging with Track 2 Accountability to coordinate activity within Ukraine, to innovate with the latest technologies and also legal methods to be in this for the long haul. When justice comes to Ukraine, it's not going to be quick. It is going to be in the span of decades. And we need to be there to preserve the evidence for that period of time. Over 50% of our budget is um, going to be spent with Ukrainian nationals. And we have been very generously supported um, through a variety of partners that are stakeholders that have joined us in the effort um, within the broader cryptographic community. What we mean by crypto is not cryptocurrency, we're using crypto for its fundamental properties of cryptography, right? That's actually what crypto stands for. And we use cryptography to both protect and authenticate content. And if you look at the stack of Web3, most of the noise has been at the very top with payments and applications. We look at it from actually a different lens. We look at it from the bottom up and we think about storage. We think about content addressing, identity, and governance. These are the crypto utilities that are critical to the work that we do. And in particular, with storage, what is so important to us about it is that as opposed to centralized single points of failure with storage, which is the predominant Web2 architecture of today, now you have possibilities of, with Web3 of moving away from centralized infrastructure to distributed architecture, which gives us distributed capacity and distributed processing. Simply put, if you have more capacity, you have more copies of critical evidence. And if you have more processing, it's harder to manipulate that evidence. So think of the strategy as strength through numbers, but resilience through diversity. So in working with our team, we decided to make a submission to the international court that not only provided them a new evidence base for the war crimes that were occurring in Ukraine, but also we submitted the first cryptographic dossier to them that had links back to Web3. It was a major accomplishment for our lab, and I want to just go very quickly over how we deployed this technology. We did it through what's called the Starling framework, which we've developed over the last four years. And I like to think about it in this context as something very similar to an object that actually most people know just even by watching television, right? That when you have something that's vulnerable as a telegram post, and you want to preserve it for evidence, you don't put it in your pocket. You put it in an evidence bag, which has a tamper-proof seal at the top, metadata, a chain of custody, and finally, there's an audit around it. Everything I'm about to describe to you, if you remember one thing, it's just like this bag. That's actually what we're doing. So what do we do? We take the Telegram post, and the first thing we need to do is actually download it, and we are able to now have an offline version of that post. Big shout out to our team over at Web Recorder. Um, our friends there with Ilya um, are, have done incredible work in providing a very rich, authenticated form of web archiving that allows us to get the content, the metadata. We also have a, a hash of the agent that does the scraping. We have an independent attestation of time and date because we're in Web3. We use uh, the Bitcoin ledger with um, 
as a protocol for establishing an ordering service for time and date. And then we have a certificate that pseudo-anonymously allows us to uh, declare who has done this work. All of that gets put into the bag, and then we encrypt it. Now, what we do from that point is a, a very novel thing that is specific to this ecosystem is that we need to have an independent attestation of the authenticity of this content. And we do that by using a content identifier. We take a CID of both the unencrypted content and the encrypted content, and then we begin to register it on nine different L1s. This is the essential step of storing the record of the authenticity of this content now on Web3. I like to think of this as a kind of the back of the envelope. This is $30 billion worth of infrastructure. It can be leveraged at a fraction of a penny, and it's one that we don't need to ask Jeff Bezos for permission to use. We don't need to rely on Mark Zuckerberg for waking up on the right side of the bed and not taking it down. This is our web. This is resilient because it is distributed. So take it as essentially the equivalent of the Telegram post, now in the bag. Then we preserve the content. We make multiple copies of it, we shard it, and then we put it onto multiple different storage protocols, including things like Filecoin, which have a cryptographic audit that every 24 hours checks the integrity of the information to ensure that it hasn't been modified. Think of it as the digital equivalent of a night watchman walking up and down an evidence locker every night to make sure that the bags have not been disturbed. Then finally, we take that content and we put it in through our verification step, which allows us to establish stewardship of the content through a custody NFT, and then we provide access to authorized investigators. So that lets them take the bag, open it up, and examine the contents to do their own expert verification of the information. And that verification itself is done by multiple parties, and all of that, too, is registered on Web3. So we now have an independent, persistent registration of what the experts are saying so that in 20 years from now, we can now have confidence around the integrity of this type of analysis. Again, it's the equivalent of a detective getting authorized access to that bag, examining the contents, and filling out their report. That's it. That's the Starling framework. We've used it with Telegram posts. We've then gone on to a variety of other different media types, and we're including now edge sensors for all sorts of different detection, including chemical weapons and nuclear attack uh, monitoring. We also have uh, satellite imagery, which we're adding to the stack. And what we did is we took an initial evidence base, which was of those ephemeral online posts, and we use this methodology I've just described to file an Article 15 submission with the ICC. We did that in early June, and we followed up with two additional briefings to the ICC that provided over 100 pages worth of legal documentation about why we believed our documentation proved a series of war crimes that, in, uh, that happened in, uh, for events that happened in March, um, but it also included this now additional cryptographic evidence. We, we're able to take five different schools and provide evidence for them, and I just wanted to show you them here. This is School 17. This is the first known documentation of it from the inside of the classroom. Here it is, independent attestations from the outside of the classroom. Here is Human Rights Watch documentation that is um, for people that were on the ground. We have here not only information, but also misinformation from pro-Russian accounts that were trying to distort this evidence. And then we even submitted uh, evidence of uh, that uh, was investigators who were on the ground doing authenticated photography of School 17. You can see this here. That authentication is now embedded inside of the photograph. And now here with the offline information with Rev Recorder, we, we, you can start to see here's this dossier taking shape. Now, going in the evidence bag, let me show you the proofs. Here is this evidence now on Ethereum. Now on Avalanche. Now on ISCN, see Phoebe is here, big shout out to Litecoin. On Polygon, on Hedera, there's a timestamp for Bitcoin, and there it is on Filecoin, and on storage. There's someone here who speaks Ukrainian, what, what does this say? We need peace. 
we need to ensure that this type of technology, which is doing this form of authentication, cannot run on hype. And it's something that requires much more than money. I want to suggest to you that in this new era that we're entering into Web3, that really, that there might yet be a different origin story for the purpose of what we're doing. Although a lot of the technology began with work that was done at the, during the financial crisis, trying to provide an alternative for the banking system, I wonder, maybe this is the moment where we start a new chapter and we think about the integrity of the internet and what is under siege. Because let me be clear, Russia is in the process of removing itself from the Western internet. So the type of authenticity that we are creating here is vital to the survival of the global internet. It is vital to the integrity of the internet as we know it. And I want to end by saying that although there are meaningful criticisms of Web3, and that there are reasons to believe that we in fact have lost our way in thinking about the type of greed and incentives that might be animating this space, I'd argue to you that we shouldn't run away from this type of criticism. Instead, with something like Project Dokaz, what we're really thinking about is confronting the criticism with something else. It's Dokaz. It's Dokaz that this type of technology actually works. Proof, Dokaz, that it's ethical. Proof, Dokaz, that it's resilient. Dokaz is it's responsible. Dokaz is it's inclusive. This is your web. This is our future. So many people have helped us to get to this point, to do the work that we have now, but the task is surely not over. So I welcome you to join us. Thank you so much for having me here, and we look forward to working together with all of you.